on World News Tonight. Meeting of the Giants. Xi Jinping meets Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin in a move that sent the West scrambling. Building ties. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida visits India to build ties between the two Asian superpowers. Forceful takeover. UBS is set to buy Credit Suisse in a major shotgun merger. And rising back up. China's populace gets back to their day-to-day -day life as COVID measures lessen in the mainland. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening to all our viewers joining us on World News Tonight, where we bring you the latest news from around the planet. Now we start off tonight's broadcast with a look into the much anticipated meeting between Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping. A meeting which kept the West and their allies on their heels. Xi Jinping has now begun a three-day state visit to Russia where she is expected to play as a peace broker of the Ukraine crisis during his talks with Russian leader Vladimir Putin. A visit for peace. That's what Beijing is calling the three-day visit by Chinese President Xi Jinping to Russia to speak with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. The visit marks his first trip to Russia in four years and comes just over a year after Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. Beijing signaled earlier that she is trying to broker a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine, and this visit may be the start of that. According to Putin's top foreign policy advisor, Yuri Yushikov, the two leaders will hold an informal one-on-one -on -one meeting, followed by dinner on Monday and hold negotiation talks on Tuesday. While the two sides will also discuss other matters, including economic cooperation, talks will likely mainly center on the possible peace deal. Xi is also expected to speak to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky over the phone following his visit to Russia. Meanwhile, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for the Russian president on Friday for alleged war crimes, with the court accusing Russia of the unlawful forced deportation of Ukrainian children. The Kremlin responded strongly to the arrest warrant, with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stressing that ICC decisions have no meaning to Russia, including from a legal point of view. While the arrest warrant won't likely put Putin behind bars at The Hague anytime soon, it will mean the ICC's 123 member states are obligated to detain and transfer Putin if he sets foot in their country or territory. Despite being a wanted man in the eyes of the ICC, Putin made a surprise visit to occupied Mariupol on Saturday. Mariupol had long been a symbol of Ukrainian resistance before control of the city was lost last May. Putin's trip to the city also comes on the back of the nine-year anniversary of Russia's annexation of Crimea. Now over in our neighboring India, Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida landed in New Delhi for a two-day visit to the country. Kishida will announce a new plan for an open and free Indo-Pacific and seek India support to partner with Tokyo to check China's growing influence across the region during his visit. Japanese officials said that under the plan, Japan will increase support to emerging economies, especially in the region. India and Japan have been adding more depth to their relations, especially in defense and strategic affairs, as both face threats from a dominant China. Kishida's decision to announce his new plan during the annual summit between the two countries underlines the importance Tokyo places on New Delhi as a key player in the Indo-Pacific region. Modi and Kishida met three times in 2022, including at Abe's funeral, and will meet at least three more times in 2023 on the sidelines of the G20, G7 and Quad summits. The two countries have a comprehensive economic partnership and trade was worth $20.57 billion in 2021 to 2022, with India importing Japanese goods valued at $14.49 billion. Now still in the region, a speeding bus weared off a major expressway in central Bangladesh and plunged into a ditch, killing at least 19 people and injuring dozens. The death toll could rise further as some of the injured passengers are in critical condition where the crash occurred. The city is 80 kilometers away from the capital, Dhaka. The bus carrying more than 40 passengers fell about 9 meters into a roadside ditch after breaking through the railing of the newly built Padma River Bridge Expressway. The driver who was killed appeared to have have lost control of the vehicle after the tire of the bus burst, adding that the cause of the accident was under investigation. 
Road accidents are common in Bangladesh, often blamed on reckless driving, old vehicles and poor safety rules and killing thousands each year. In 2018, a series of massive student protests sparked by the death of two teenagers forcing Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government to approve raising the maximum prison time to five years from three for causing death by rash driving. Now focusing on the pending global banking crisis, troubled bank Credit Suisse has been rescued by its Swiss rival UBS in a government-backed deal. The announcement came after a weekend of emergency talks in Switzerland between the two banks and the country's financial regulators. In a shotgun merger engineered by Swiss authorities and announced on Sunday, UBS will buy rival Swiss bank Credit Suisse for more than $3 billion and assume up to $5.4 billion in losses. UBS Chair Colm Kelleher. We have agreed a framework of support with the Swiss regulators which ensures a successful integration in the best interests of Switzerland and protects our shareholders. The deal won applause from other central bankers keen to avoid market-shaking turmoil. Officials have been racing to rescue the 167-year-old bank, among the world's largest wealth managers, after a brutal last week saw two U.S. lenders, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, collapse. This is no bailout. This is, 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 is a commercial solution. Swiss Finance Minister Karen Keller-Sutter said the deal would prevent a crisis of confidence in Credit Suisse that could ripple through global financial markets. The bankruptcy of Credit Suisse would have had a collateral damage, a huge collateral damage on the Swiss financial market, also a risk of contagion for UBS and other banks, and also internationally. At least two major banks in Europe are examining scenarios of contagion possibly spreading in the region's banking sector and looking to the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank to step in with stronger signals of support, according to two senior executives with knowledge of the discussions. In a sign of a coordinated global response, the European Central Bank vowed to support Eurozone banks with loans if needed, adding the Swiss rescue of Credit Suisse was instrumental for restoring calm. Now, experts have been saying that France is potentially heading towards the sequel of the French Revolution as it faced another day of protests against a bitterly contested pension reform rammed through by President Emmanuel Macron's government before crucial no-confident votes in the Assemblée Nationale. It's set to be a decisive moment for France at the National Assembly on Monday. By the end of the day, we'll know whether or not the controversial pension reform is passed. Outrage erupted in the chamber last Thursday when the Prime Minister used the 49-3 article to force the legislation through without a vote. Two votes of no confidence were filed as a result. One by the far-right national rally, which is unlikely to succeed. The other by a group of other opposition parties, co-signed by the left-wing coalition group. For it to pass, they'll need 287 votes. The presidential camp already holds 250, while the opposition holds 257, meaning that with 61 votes, all eyes are on the right wing Les Républicains. So far, only a handful of Les Républicains MPs have said they would vote against the government. But La France Insoumise party continues to hope for their support. You know as well as I do that the government is on the verge of collapse. And that is Les Républicains that have been pushed against the wall because they'll have the final say. And we can hope for a party that can take to be the goal as to still say that's enough. But we're against you. The whole thing is that at some point they say that there's a time when 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 they say that there's a time if the vote of no confidence fails, which experts say is likely, the next step for the reform is an appeal by opposition groups to a council that will be tasked with making sure the legislation is in line with the constitution. Even if the legislation is passed, the Prime Minister is now in a fragile position and her government faces an uncertain future. As for the President, it's unclear when he'll finally address the people about the crisis. That's going for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now over in the United States, former U.S. President Donald Trump has stated that he expects to be arrested in connection with the years-long investigation into a hush money scheme involving adult film actress Stormy Daniels and called on his supporters to protest any such move. 
Former U.S. President Donald Trump said he expects to be arrested Tuesday and called on his supporters to protest as prosecutors consider charges over a hush money payment to a porn star. On his social media platform Truth Social, Trump posted Saturday that a leak from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office indicated, quote, the far and away leading Republican candidate and former president of the United States of America will be arrested on Tuesday of next week. Trump, whose supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, in a failed effort to overturn his 2020 election defeat, wrote, quote, protest, take our nation back. A spokesman for Trump said the former president had not been notified of any arrest. Trump provided no evidence of leaks and did not discuss the possible charges in his post. The probe comes at a critical time as Trump seeks the re-election nomination for the presidency in 2024. No U.S. president has faced criminal charges while in office or afterward. A spokesperson for Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg declined to comment. His office has been investigating a $130,000 payment made by Trump's former personal lawyer Michael Cohen to porn star Stormy Daniels in the run-up to the 2016 election. Hi, everyone. Trump has called the investigation a witch hunt. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on Saturday decried the investigation. He announced his own investigation into whether federal funds are being used to interfere in elections by what he described as a politically motivated prosecution of Trump. Trump has said he will continue campaigning even if he is charged with a crime. Now, as the war in Ukraine keeps brewing, Russian President Vladimir Putin traveled to Crimea to mark the ninth anniversary of the Black Sea Peninsula's liberation from Ukraine, days after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for the Russian leader, accusing him of war crimes. A surprise visit to Crimea. Putin's first since the invasion of Ukraine just over a year ago. It marks the ninth anniversary of Russia's annexation of the peninsula. He was greeted by the local Moscow-installed governor. The annexation would have never happened if the will of the people hadn't been supported by our leader Vladimir Putin. During that whole time, he was in touch with Sevastopol residents, the Crimeans, and did everything so that Crimea and Sevastopol returned to Russia. The visit comes a day after the ICC issued an arrest warrant against Putin and his Children's Rights Commissioner accusing them of the war crime of illegally deporting hundreds of children from Ukraine. Since Russia is not a party to the ICC, it is unclear if Putin will end up in the dark. Moscow has dismissed the warrant as void, while Putin has not yet commented. Now, in the latest in a series of provocations in the Far East, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has called on the regime to stand ready to conduct nuclear attacks in order to deter war at any time. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un called for the regime to stand fully ready with nuclear attacks to deter war, in a remark made during a military drill over the weekend. The North state-led Korean Central News Agency reported on Monday morning that North Korean troops on Saturday and Sunday trained to improve their nuclear attack skills in a two-day course. Kim Jong-un oversaw the training and again brought his daughter along, who seems to be Kim Jong-un's protege. Kim added in his statement that simply having nuclear weapons is no longer enough to deter war. The North must strike fear to enemies by becoming ready with its nuclear attacks. And on Sunday morning, North Korea fired another short-range ballistic missile from Tersangun, Pyongyangbukdo province, off toward the EC as part of its training, KCNA said. It added that the missile achieved its target by flying 800 kilometers to blow up 800 meters above the sea. It also said the drill did not in any way harm the safety of neighboring countries. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff also confirmed on Sunday that they detected a short-range ballistic missile flying for about 800 kilometers and fired off toward the East Sea. This missile firing comes in the middle of Freedom Shield, the 11-day long Seoul washington joint drill. North Korea has been protesting against these war games by ramping up its weapons tests and increasing hostility in their rhetoric. The KCNA mentioned the North's discontent at American strategic assets being deployed to South Korea for the joint military training and said that this training is also to send a stronger warning to Seoul and Washington as they continue with their exercises. 
Now, following North Korea's and Kim Jong-un's stark nuclear threats, foreign ministers from the Group of Seven Nations and the EU strongly condemned the ICBM test launches and the threat of a potential tip-over, brinkmanship due to North Korea's, quote, careless actions. They also said inaction by the UN Security Council was regrettable, unsurprisingly pointing the finger at China and Russia. Foreign ministers of the G7 nations, including the U.S., the U.K., and Japan and the E.U., condemned yet another missile launch by North Korea in the strongest terms, saying it undermines regional and international peace and security. In a statement released by the U.S. State Department on Sunday local time, the foreign ministers said they deeply regret inaction by the U.N. Security Council because of, quote, obstruction by some members. Although not named, the statement apparently referred to China and Russia, who have blocked recent efforts to impose tougher sanctions on North Korea. They added that North Korea's reckless behavior demands a swift and unified response from the international community, and called on all UN member states to fully implement all UN Security Council resolutions. Following Sunday's missile launch, the top nuclear envoys of South Korea, U.S. and Japan also condemned Pyongyang's latest provocation and discussed their coordinated responses. Seoul's foreign ministry said Kim Gon, the special representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs, held phone talks with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Sung Kim and Takehiro Funakoshi, where they called the North's actions a threat to peace and stability that clearly violates multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions. The three officials also agreed to build a firm and unified response against the North's provocations at the upcoming U.N. Security Council's meeting in New York on Monday. Now over in South America, as at least 13 people died after a magnitude 6.8 earthquake struck southern Ecuador. According to the United States Geological Survey, the earthquake struck near the southern town of Balao and was more than 65 kilometers deep. A strong earthquake shook a coastal region of Ecuador and northern Peru on Saturday. It damaged homes, schools and medical centers. At least 14 people were killed and more than 380 injured in the quake according to the Ecuadorian Presidency's communication agency, largely in the El Oro province. The quake was measured at magnitude 6.8 and did not appear likely to generate a tsunami, authorities said. <laughs> this was the moment shoppers ran from a supermarket in Guayaquil when the quake hit. This museum on a pier in the coastal area of Ecuador's El Oro province was almost completely submerged after it collapsed as a result. Dozens of homes have been destroyed. Many roadways were blocked by landslides caused by the earthquake. The Santa Rosa airport suffered minor damage but remained in operation. The initial quake was followed by two weaker aftershocks in the following hour, according to the Geophysics Institute of Ecuador. We'll come back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Sergio Perez won the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix from pole position in a Red Bull 1-2 with Max Verstappen racing to second with the fastest lap. Fernando Alonso of Aston Martin came third, followed closely by the two Mercedes of George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. An atmospheric river dumped more torrential rain on California, forcing evacuations, power outages and road closures in the state. Authorities said they are monitoring the river level to determine how long the orders will be kept in place. Montenegro's veteran president Milo Djokovic will face a runoff on April 2nd against pro-West and former economy minister after no candidate secured a 50% majority in a first-round election, according to a projection based on 99.7% of the vote sample. Palestinians protested in Hebron and Gaza against talks between Israel and Palestinian officials in Egypt aimed at calming a surge of violence in the West Bank ahead of the holy Muslim month of Ramadan. Toyota's eight-time WRC world champion Sebastian Ovier took victory in the one and Rally Mexico to move to the top of the overall standings on 56 points, three ahead of Hyundai's Thierry Neuville. The veteran Frenchman finished ahead of Belgian Neuville to secure a record seventh title in Mexico. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. And finally, we leave you tonight with visuals of North China's Tianjin, where its municipality has initiated a splashy consumption promotion campaign, blending consumption with spring outings, sports activities and flower appreciation. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.